What are your personal reflections on the trip to Mustang, which is one of the world's most beautiful destinations? It really was one of the most beautiful places I've been in a very interesting way. You had the high Him Himalayas and the, that uh, showed you the snow caps with this very desolate but very beautiful uh, foreground of canyons and uh, rivers. Uh, also a very stark reminder of just how, how this beauty extracts a heavy price for the people who live there, that it is not an easy environment in which to live. Uh, it, is, it is cold, it's difficult for transportation and communication, but we saw a number of changes, and I think how they manage those changes that allow them to keep their unique culture. Uh, the cell phone towers had already been created in Jomsom. They were on their way to Lomantang, uh, the airfields that allow the helicopters to come into Lomantang and airplanes into Jomsom clearly have a, an influence. Uh, I remember listening to the pilgrim stories when I was here before. Now you can go to Muktinath in a jeep. Uh, so that is a very different uh, way to get goods and services. Um, still obvious that it is hard to get government services, to get teachers and doctors and the health clinics, the schools to function as they do in other parts of Nepal. And so those are going to be challenges. As the road comes in, what changes does that bring? Uh, certainly it, brings it makes it much easier for people to get goods in to, to move around, but it also could do very big damage to the environment. It may bring in a lot of outsiders. And those are issues that the people in Mustang, the government in Nepal, are going to, to need to consider. But I was also impressed. Uh, it, I'm uh, not a trekker by nature, and uh, you had a, a full appreciation for just how difficult life is for people that need to do this on a, 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 a daily basis, or certainly in order to get their, the basic needs that they have. Um, I did it for 10 days. I can't imagine doing it for a lifetime, and uh, I have a, a real admiration for their stamina and how well they cope with their environment. A large number of Nepalese students are pursuing their education in U.S. colleges. The current global economic crisis suggests that there will be a cut in scholarship, while Obama's administration say that there will be a rise in the international seats in the U.S. colleges. What will be the status of Nepalese students applying for education in the U.S.? I think there's a number of points in, in your question. We're very proud of the fact that Nepal has the 11th largest number of students in the United States. And this isn't on a per capita basis. I think if you did it on a per capita basis, Nepal might be up in the, in the top three. But this is total number of students. So Nepali students have, have chosen to go to the United States. We're very, very pleased with that. And certainly the colleges and universities where they go have been pleased to, to welcome them. Uh, I went back to my own college, which is a teaching college, uh, prepares primarily teachers uh, for high schools and grade schools. And there were six Nepali students in the middle of Iowa. So that was a, a very pleasant surprise, but also a, just an example of how diverse the population is in the schools that they go to. Um, the scholarships are going to go down as the economy goes down, uh, but also there are increasing uh, numbers of people who provide private scholarships to Nepalis. I think the, the government of the United States is looking at how we can help foreign students. There's no direct program yet to, to look at that beyond our usual programs. But um, I would expect that our, our student numbers will remain high. I think Nepalis understand that they get very good quality for their money when they go to the United States. Uh, I would like to appeal to the students to uh, do their homework as they go to the United States to use the facilities of the U.S. Education Foundation, the Internet, to inform themselves. We did a program last year um, that tried to identify that some of the consulting firms, some of the advisory councils are not providing them with good advice and that they need to have a, an honest set of applications of forms and, and information on their finances and and then a clear idea of what it is they want to do in the United States. And those will get them the visa, not the pre-formed answers to questions or something from the, uh, some of these uh, consulting firms that are less than, than honest. We are grateful for the scholarships that the U.S. government provides to innovative, creative, hardworking Nepalese students through Fulbright and East-West scholarships and other scholarships that comes directly from the U.S. colleges. 
However, does not this generous offer also contributes to Nepal's major issue of rin rin? I think particularly for the U.S. government sponsored programs, which are the Fulbright programs, the Humphrey programs, the East-West Center, all of those require the students, once they have completed their training in the United States, to come back to Nepal for a minimum of two years. We've had uh, a lot, I've had a lot of interaction with the alumni of those programs, and they have formed an organization here in Nepal uh, for each of the scholarships and then an umbrella organization. And I find them to be among the most creative and uh, people in Nepal. They are uh, doing a variety of things in academic institutions, in business, in, in government. Uh, so we are very, very pleased with that. I think it's an example of the payback. Of they have remained very active in, in whatever their the field of study, but also they brought back attitudes that give them a, a, an idea of public service, and we're, we're very, very proud of that. The public or the scholarships from the universities themselves do not carry that same requirement to come back. But I think as Nepal opens up, as it continues its democratic transition, uh, certainly those people come back uh, in greater numbers than perhaps they did at one time. I also think now with the internet and particularly the, the connections that they can make it, they can and do make a, a real contribution. I know there is a very active uh, Nepali network in the United States that is constantly commenting on Nepali politics and constitutional development. And I had a, a Nepali American professor in my office last week who was presenting a, a, an idea on how to, to do federalism in Nepal. So I think that constant interaction, if, even if people are not physically present in Nepal, uh, perhaps their hearts and their brains are still here and looking for ways that they can contribute. And the remittances from the United States, as from so many other countries where Nepalese work, are an important underpinning of the ec economy right now until Nepal can get its own economy up and running and provide the jobs. So I think those are all important factors that offset the loss of, of some of the, the brightest and the best that go to the United States and other countries. Prosperity will directly contribute to a democratic, peaceful, and progressive Nepal. Is there any chance that there will be U.S. investments in the business sector in the future? Well, we, we continue to hope so. I've, I've met with the entrepreneurs that we have here. Some of them are big names um, of internationally known firms that continue to work in Nepal. Others are very, very small, uh, but they are providing employment and ideas for for Nepalese, and so we're, we're proud of the entire range of them. I think as I've met with them, and we met particularly with those who are, would be considered foreign investors, they, they document a lot of issues and concerns that they have. Um, there are concerns over particularly labor issues, and Nepal's labor laws are very difficult for particularly Americans to administer. They're very different than our labor laws. The overtones of uh, strikes and buns that have interfered with their ability to work um, make it hard to make an advertisement for Nepal to come and invest. I think particularly the load shedding, any time that you have to add to your costs with the generator for 18 hours a day to run your factory, when you can look at other places that have full-time electricity, a businessman does not necessarily go with his heart. He's looking at the bottom line. And that, that fact alone makes it very, very difficult for Nepal to compete with other places. So dealing with the power issues, dealing with the labor issues, um, I think making sure that the procurement process is transparent. Uh, we have an American company engaged in a major government procurement right now and want to ensure that they have a fair chance that it's an even-handed uh, procurement process, and those are challenges in Nepal uh, that Nepal needs to continue to work on. I think uh, there are many people who, particularly American investors who have come to the subcontinent, India, perhaps to Pakistan or to Bangladesh, um, and if they're already in the subcontinent, they're used to dealing with some of these issues, and they're more willing to, to take a look at Nepal, but Nepal is going to have to work at having a better uh, story to attract these people and, and to meet their bottom line that they can make a profit here.